Here in Minnesota, you have refugees, immigrants, adoptees from Asia, whose stories are beginning to appear in published articles, books, in film, video documentaries. And you also have Asian Americans who are already third, fourth, and fifth generation, maybe more. Um, and some of them have begun writing their stories. This is all wonderful. But I suggest that there is certainly much more which can be done, and done in a fashion that treasures the commonplace, as well as the heroic, the everyday, as well as the famous. Later, years and generations from now, researchers, students, and your own descendants will thank you for this. This, this diligence is extremely important. I will tell you also that institutions like the Smithsonian will thank you too. And I will try to explain this by describing my work over the past um, dozen years. In, in my own case, my, both sets of my grandparents came to the United States from Hiroshima Prefecture in, in Japan. My dad's parents went to Kauai uh, in Hawaii in the early 1890s, and he was born there in 1910. My mom's parents went to Colorado, and she was born there in 1917. Both were taken to Japan by their parents when they were very young and returned to the United States, to Hawaii in the, in the 1930s. That's kind of a long story, but um, yeah, you'll have to wait for the book. They met and married in Honolulu, and I was the firstborn of four kids in the family. I went to public schools in Honolulu while we lived on a small vegetable farm in what is now a suburb. Then I attended college and went to graduate school, as you've, as you've heard. My first um, teaching position was at Occidental College in Los Angeles in 1968. And that was a period of intense civil rights activism and questioning of national priorities in the war in Southeast Asia. I got deeply involved in both and soon joined the program at UCLA, which formed Asian American Studies. I think it's fair to say that most of us then engage in the struggle to create ethnic studies, believing that this was a way to learn how and why the United States was so divided by race and, and ethnicity at home, and why, how and why we were so intent on military engagement in so many places, including Southeast Asia, over such a long period in our history. If you're following the debate over banning ethnic studies in schools in Arizona, you may be interested in knowing that certainly at times there may be instructors who overreach and who may be perceived as um, trying to create divisions in the society. But certainly we did analyze ideas and practices of white supremacy in the past and, and some cases in the present. So in some ways this was a necessary exercise. For example, it was eye-opening to learn that the first instance of immigration discrimination occurred when Congress determined in 1882 that four groups of people would not be allowed into the country. These were felons, serious criminals, paupers, serious poverty-stricken people, the mentally insane, and the Chinese. By the early 1920s, basically all Asians were barred from entering the United States and from becoming naturalized citizens. So were people from the Pacific. So it was not until 1965 that these laws were removed and the surge of immigrants from India, the Philippines, Korea, and China began. And of course, the large influx of Lao, Hmong, and Vietnamese began in 1975 with the withdrawal of American forces from Southeast Asia. But most ethnic studies instructors deal with information and analysis that call for critical thinking and really, I think, should be pursued by students of all races and ethnicities. I mention this to say that in local and regional areas like Minnesota or Hawaii or California or Washington State or Texas, Cultural organizations will need to pay special attention to these new groups. The University of Minnesota is uh, fortunate to have institutions like the Immigration History Research Center, 
which collects documentation of Asian immigrant groups in this region. And I, I will tell you, looking at the issues from Washington, D.C., an international institution, local and regional areas have people who know from the ground what people, what institutions have been important to the development of these communities here and are in a unique position to be able to say which things should be collected and kept. You see Irvine, for example, the University of California Irvine, has a splendid collection of materials from uh, Southeast Asian uh, refugees, and it's, it's a place that you, you really uh, should know about. The Wing Luke Museum in Seattle, Washington, has a great program um, incorporating so many Asian American and Pacific Islander groups in Seattle and the Northwest. Uh, the Museum of Chinese in the Americas in Manhattan in New York City has a new structure partly designed by the renowned architect Maya Lin and has great collections from Chinese immigrants and their children. The Japanese Culture Center of Hawaii does the same thing for Japanese Americans in Hawaii. But one of the problems with local-based, and you know this very well here, um, with local-based institutions is limitations of space, personnel, and funding. This is especially true where museums and libraries are dependent on funding by state and local governments, and where difficult economic times impact their ability to do their jobs. So let me turn to our national institutions and what I think uh, they might be able to do uh, to support the efforts that local and regional um, folks are, are pursuing so diligently. Let me say a few words about the Library of Congress first. Um, and I want to start by saying that those of us who are doing this work in, in the communities across the country should not be assumed to be grateful to these institutions for doing the work that they ought to be doing. That they need to be incorporating the extraordinary richness and diversity of our uh, society as a whole. And so having them include APA history, culture, expertise is uh, something that they should do. And we do not need to be um, particularly grateful for that. We need, they need to be expected to do their jobs. The, the Library of Congress is the oldest federal cultural institution created by President John Adams in 1800. Its original modest holdings were burned by the British when they invaded in 1814, and, and former President Thomas Jefferson offered his private collection, which was accepted in the 1820s. Today, there are over 140 million books, records, films, documents, photos, and artifacts in the library in 430 different languages and covering the entire globe. Its mission is to serve the research needs of the United States Congress and the general public as well. 